All right, welcome. Um, we move it on to chapter 16. It's going to be all about probability. Um, this, so this first section is just going to be an introduction to that. Um, you'll find that a lot of the information from chapter 15 is still going to be very relevant here. So hopefully you've not forgotten all that already. But let's jump right in. There's a lot of information in this video. First up, we have a few definitions. Um, so this first one is called random phenomenon. Situation in which we know what outcomes can possibly occur, but we don't know which particular outcome will happen. So the greatest example of a random phenomenon is flipping a coin. Because it is one of the most common and easiest to model. So that would be an example of a random phenomenon. We know it's either heads or tails, but we do not know which particular outcome will happen every time you flip. Okay, um, and random phenomenons, uh, that random is, is actually pretty key because it's it's going to, we, when we know the possible outcomes and kind of the probabilities of each outcome, it's gonna be pretty easy to make predictions and uh, model based off that. So the randomness behind it is actually quite valuable to us. Situations that would not be random, um, at least in a probability sense, is if someone came up to you and asked you, name the first sports team that comes into your head, okay? Because it's not actually going to be random. I mean, you have, each person has a sports team they would probably say in that situation. So that would not be a random phenomenon. A trial, which is a single attempt, so that would just be a single coin flip. The outcome, um, that's just going to be what the actually occurs. So outcome of our example of flipping a coin, those are either going to be heads or tails. And an event, that is a collection of outcomes. So let's say we wanted to figure out the, the event of getting four tails in a row. That would be an example of an event. All right, so uh, these are not, not too uh, confusing definitions, but just important to know as we go forward. All right, so sample space. So the sample space is gonna be very important for, to us um, in order to model some of these probabilities. It is the collection of all possible outcomes, okay? So noted with either S or so mega here. Um, so a simple sa sample space for flipping a coin usually write it like this, it's fancy brackets. Okay, the two outcomes are heads or tails. So that would be flipping a coin. Another sample space for rolling a single die would be one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, it is just a straight up list of all the possible outcomes arranged like that. Okay, sometimes the sample spaces are going to be quite easy to write out, like those two examples there. Sometimes if there's millions of possibilities, it's going to become quite tiresome. Um, even this, this is the sample space for choosing a card from a, from a deck. All right, the list of options is quite long. Um, so you don't need to always be able to list every single outcome, but you do need to figure, it is very important to be able to figure out how many possible outcomes there are. All right. If you can remember this simple formula, all right, you will master probability. It all comes down to this, okay? Probability, the probability of an event, all right, the theoretical probability is just number of desired outcomes over total outcomes, all right? Desired outcomes over total outcomes. All right, it all boils down to that. If you can remember that, you're gonna become the king of probability. Um, the tricky part sometimes is figuring out how many desired outcomes there are and how many possible outcomes are there. But really, it all comes down to this. So this simple, these two simple examples I have right down here. The probability of picking a diamond from a deck of cards, okay? Well, the desired outcomes there okay is going to be number of cards well there's 52 total cards in a deck and there are 13 of those are diamonds so it's going to be one fourth 
easy as that. Okay, and that's it. If you, you see, probability is easy. Same thing with probability of picking a face card. All right, total number of cards, 52. Total number of face cards, 12. There you go. Okay, a few other kind of probability rules to kind of keep track of. Probability must be between zero and one. Okay, if you notice in that last slide, I was writing them as a fraction. You can write them as a decimal, you can write them as a percent, but it never makes sense to say the probability of some event A, okay, that's what this notation means, the probability of event A equals 1.2. Makes no sense, okay? It has to be between zero and one, whether you write it as a fraction, decimal, or percent. All right, uh, for any event, um, so if the event never happens, the probability of A is zero. So anything that's impossible, the probability would be zero. If the event always happens, the probability would be one. Okay. Um, so for example, things that would be zero, the probability of not heads. Ugh. not heads nor tails if you're flipping a coin is going to be zero you have to have one of them by extension the probability of heads or tails that's going to equal one every single flip of the coin has to be one of those Second probability outcome, this axiom, excuse me, the set of all possible outcomes of a trial must have probability of one. It's basically this is saying the probability of the sample space equals one. Okay, um, it's going to be important to kind of figure out um, basically the probability of each kind of aspect of our sample space because um, it's all coming down to that desired outcomes over total outcomes. Um, this is also referred to as the probability assignment rule. Basically, the probability of the whole sample space has got to equal one, okay? Axiom three, okay? This is gonna be about complements. Um, and so the set of all outcomes that are not in the event A is called the complement of A, and it's noted as AC. The book usually writes this as A with a bar on top. I don't really like that notation because it actually means something different um, when you're getting stati statistics when you write that. So I prefer the little superscript, but either one of them works. Complement is just the probability of an event occurring is one minus the probability that it does not occur. Okay, so it's the same kind of thing that we've dealt with in combinatorics. Um, it's going to be a very useful word for I mean, a very useful rule for us. And the cue to use this is going to be the same. It's going to be helpful when we see those words at least in the problem, okay? That's gonna kind of indicate to us that it's probably gonna be a good idea to use this complement rule. All right, and we, this is axiom four. We dealt with this word a little bit in combinatorics, this word mutually exclusive or disjoint they mean the same thing these are events that have no outcomes in common okay so in this over here on the left these are examples of disjoint events if you are rolling a single die event a getting an odd number and event b getting a six okay they have no outcomes in common so those are going to be mutually exclusive events the kind of opposite of disjoint opposite of mutually exclusive is called overlapping events not in this case, event A get a number over four, event B get an odd number, they have that outcome five in common. So those would not be mutually exclusive events. So mutually exclusive is important because it is involved in this addition rule. So this is if events A and B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A union B, and remember this is just the probability of A or B 
equals the probability of A plus the probability of B. Okay, this requires that they are mutually exclusive. What if they are not mutually exclusive? Then you use this kind of more general addition rule. So if this is the probability of A or B, okay, you add probability of A plus the probability of B, and then you subtract out the overlap. Remember, this is just referring to that A intersection B, which means the same thing as probability of A and B, okay? This is exactly like the inclusion exclusion principle that we use in combinatorics, okay? Just written in probability notation, but it works the same exact way. Anytime you're trying to figure out the probability of A or B, add up the individual probabilities, subtract out the overlap. And the addition rule that I showed in the last slide, that only had this part of it. And that's because if the two events are mutually exclusive, therefore have no outcomes in common, so if two events are mutually exclusive, the probability of A and B would equal zero. Okay, so that's part, that part's left off if those are mutually exclusive because you would just be subtracting out by zero. But if they are not mutually exclusive, you need to subtract out by that overlap just like we have been doing. All right, so let's go through some examples. Um, suppose you toss a coin four times, how many different equally likely outcomes are possible? All right, well, I'm just gonna draw what's called a tree diagram just so when we get started, we can kind of visualize this. So for flipping a coin four times, all right, the first time you can get heads or tails, okay? That second flip, we can also get heads or tails. The third flip, All right, I'm running out of space here, so I won't do to the fourth flip. But I'm sure you can kind of get the, the general idea here. This is kind of a tree diagram that's modeling us through three flips of a coin. Okay, so it's kind of giving us each outcome. So like following down the branches, this H, 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 that would be three heads in a row. Okay, the T, H, H would be a tail, then a head, then a head. Okay, so... Um, I'll just, I will just kind of uh, briefly write in the last part. So we can get H T H T for each of these. Okay. So excuse the very sloppy handwriting, but how many different equally likely outcomes are, are possible, we can just count down this last column here, okay? And there would be 16. Or you can use just our multiplication principle from back in combinatorics. For the first outcome, there's two. Second flip, two. Third flip, two. Fourth flip, two. So a total of 16, okay? So that's our answer for part A. So find the probability of obtaining no heads. Okay, so thinking about this in terms of the desired outcomes over total outcomes. So probability of no heads. So it was important for part A to get that total outcomes because now we know there's 16 total outcomes. So let's take a look at the, for all the outcomes that contain no heads. Well, if you flip the head first, then you're not gonna get no heads. So all of these ones out here are out. And basically you just wanna follow the tails. So there's only gonna be one outcome and it's gonna be that one that gets all four tails. So that probability is just gonna be one over 16. 
Part C, the probability of obtaining at least one head. Hopefully your neon flashing lights are going off, that we need to use the complement rule here. Okay, so the whole sample space, the complement rule is gonna be one, and we just wanna subtract out the probability of no heads. So that's just gonna be one minus one over 16, which is 15 over 16. Okay. So the last one, I'm going to erase my tree diagram so I have room. Find the probability of obtaining exactly one head. Okay. So, Let's kind of think about all the different possibilities here. I can get, I know the total outcomes is still the 16. Now I got to kind of figure out how many desired outcomes there are. So kind of the, all the possibilities, I can get H and then I would need to get three tails. I could get a tails and H and then two tails, two tails, a heads and then a tails or three tails and a heads okay so there's those four outcomes so the probability of obtaining exactly one head is one fourth okay notice all three of my probabilities are between zero and one that'll be just a good judgment check a good uh, common sense check for you if you ever are ever getting a probability that's outside of zero to one something has gone gravely wrong and check your work but looks like we did everything correctly here all right in a well shuffled deck of cards what is the probability that you pick one of these all right so we know there's 52 cards okay since this is well shuffled we can consider this a random phenomenon Okay, probability of picking each individual card is um, equal to 1 over 52. So let's dive right in. So what's the probability that we pick a black ace? Okay, so hopefully you've listened to what I said about uh, it's important to know what is, what is in a deck of cards. We know there are four suits, um, so there'll be four total aces. Two of them are black, the diamond and the spade. So the desired outcomes is just, oops, I'll write this in proper probability notation. So the probability of a black ace, the total outcomes is 52. Desired outcomes, there are two of them. So one over 26. Part B, not a black ace. All right, so uh, not a black ace. You can easily kind of figure that out using the complement rule. So one minus the probability of a black ace. So we would just do one minus what we just found in part A, one over 26, which is 25 over 26. Part C, probability of a diamond face card. All right, so uh, let's kind of think how many diamond face cards there are. Well, there's three face cards. There's jack, queen, king, and there is one of each for diamonds. So there's three total or three desired outcomes. 52 total outcomes. So there you go. Okay, so that's a good kind of uh, 
intro to probability. Um, there's a lot, lot more to go, but this is just meant to be an introduction. Um, there you go.